laboratory safety, specifically toxicity of chemicals and how we know uh, what chemicals are dangerous and how do we actually measure that? How do we know? Okay, so you've already gone through the safety contract. We went through the safety rules, and I just let me just review just the highlight of those for you, if you don't mind. So in the science classroom, some of the things that need to be adhered to is you have to obey the safety contract, right? Use common sense, don't steal things, follow directions, that type thing, okay? So we've mentioned those before. I just want to reiterate those one more time for you. It's always very, very important for you to be wearing your safety glasses. I've got a pair here. And safety glasses can easily be worn over your regular glasses. Now, um, the one thing that people don't like about safety glasses is they hurt my eyes. And they really don't hurt your eyes. What happens is people store them flat on the tabletop and they get scratched and you're looking through a scratch lens. Then they're going to give you a little bit of a headache. But without, without that, they're going to be absolutely fine to wear. So you can either wear them with your glasses or over your glasses and they're, they're very, very useful. Okay. Um, Safety is an attitude. We talked about if you're a driver, you want to be thinking about everybody else on the road being unsafe. And then if you think about in the lab what mistakes might other people make so that I don't get harmed from their errors. That's really what we mean by safety is an attitude, right? So be looking out for a problem and it probably won't come your way. Uh, don't take anything out of the lab. You know, there's an old wife's tale, I think, of somebody stealing sodium metal. Now, sodium metal, sodium has a symbol Na, and it needs to be stored actually in oil. If it's, if it's allowed to get wet, it will explode. So the story goes that a student stole some of this from the chemistry teacher and put it in their pocket, and then it was a you know hot August day, and they were getting nervous because they stole it second hour. And then, you know, right after lunch, they were sweating and they touched it with their hands and exploded and burned them. Now, I don't think that ever happened, but sodium metal can be quite dangerous. You can look on the internet and look at sodium explosions. You can Google that or when people throw sodium in a lake to see the kind of explosions I'm talking about. I'm not going to play any of those for you right now. If you're curious, you can see that. So the way you keep sodium safe is you store it in oil, and we know oil and water don't mix, so it's safe as long as it's under the oil. You want to make sure you always read and follow all directions so that nothing unexpected happens. All right, so how are you supposed to know if a chemical is safe or not? Well, there's something called a material safety data sheet, or MSDS. And on there, it's a kind of a legal document where it's going to, the chemical manufacturer must share that information with the consumer if they ask. And it gives information about the chemical. It gives its physical state, its melting point, its density, how to store it properly, what not to mix with the material, and so on. So it'll tell you what you should do with the chemical and what you definitely should not do with the chemical. It will also give you information about toxicity or if you were to ingest, eat, smell, get it on your skin, that type information. So I'm going to call that all chemical exposure. Now, um, you will have a homework assignment tonight dealing with uh, reading and looking at a material safety data sheet for a chemical called acetone. Acetone is commonly referred to as nail polish remover. Many of you probably have it in your home, but don't realize maybe some of its safety or hazards associated with it. And so I'll have you complete the homework sheet related to the MSDS for tonight. So chemical exposure, we're going to put in two major camps. One is called acute exposure, and one is called chronic exposure. Now these might both sound if I said one of them is more dangerous than the other, you might think, oh, well, that one has the word cute in it, so that can't be very bad. Well, you'd actually be wrong on that. Acute exposure is far worse. Now, I'll give you a little visual here. Let me give you a definition first. Acute exposure says a one-time exposure can cause damage. 
you accidentally drink antifreeze, ethylene glycol, and you can die from that, doing it just one time. Chronic exposure would be damage that would occur after repeated exposure. Perhaps you are the person who collects toll at a toll booth. So every time a car comes up, they pay you the money, and then they drive away. Next car comes up, pays you the money, they drive away. And as they're doing that, you're breathing in all of their car exhaust. And you might do that for 15 or 20 years. You might as well just put your mouth up to the tailpipe and, and just suck the uh, gases coming out of the tailpipe of the car, right? That's a very unhealthy thing to do. Now, when I do demonstrations, I oftentimes will ask for volunteers. And the reason I do that is there's nothing that we're doing that's acutely toxic. But chronic exposure is a concern for me. If I have to do a demo five times a day for 25 years, I'm going to actually be getting a rather substantial exposure to these chemicals, where you're going to get it once in your lifetime, and that's it. Okay? So a visual here we can think of acute exposure is like poison. Smoking a cigarette. We all know it's not good for us and if you smoke a pack a day or two packs of cigarettes a day for 15 or 20 years you're probably going to have some health effects related to that. Let me give you another example. A lot of you um, maybe follow basketball right now and there's a basketball player I, I bet most of you unless you're a hardcore basketball fan have never heard of and he was a great basketball player I believe he played at the University of Maryland and he was drafted in 1986 and he was supposed to be better than Michael Jordan he was six foot eight his name was Len Bias now unfortunately Len Bias never made it to the NBA he was drafted I don't know, he might have even been first round pick, I'm not quite sure on that. But Len Bias decided to he was gonna party after he got his multi-million dollar contract. And it was the mid 80s and cocaine was a big thing in the 1980s. And Len Bias was a pretty straight shooting guy, didn't do drugs, uh, follow the rules, but he decided he was gonna party. He was pretty happy to make the NBA. So he got some cocaine, he snorted it, he had a massive heart attack and died right there. That's an example of acute exposure. A single episode, one time, caused great harm, in this case, death, to Len Bias, which is why you probably have never heard of Len Bias. Chemicals can harm us in lots of different ways. I personally have had my lungs collapse probably five or six times. I was born early, uh, premature. I was a premature twin, and they would give pure oxygen. And what would happen is they would get little bubbles on your lungs, and when those bubbles break, your lungs collapse, and it basically feels like somebody's giving you a giant bear hug and you can't breathe. How do they fix it? Well, they, they stick a tube in your side. It's, it's called a spontaneous pneumothorax, and they put a tube inside you into your lungs so it equalizes the pressure inside and outside of your body and the lungs reinflate in about a week you're you're good again so I'm not a big fan of cigarette smoking right how can it harm us well we know that uh, in, in general some things can be flammable they can be explosive now I'm not referring to cigarettes at this point but chemicals in general they can be flammable like gasoline. They can be explosive, also like gasoline. They can be radioactive. Now, if you follow the news, um, there was a... The, the, who, do you know who the president of Russia is? Right, Vladimir Putin. And Vladimir Putin has had several challengers while he's been the president, and they always seem to die in very, very strange ways. There was one called Alexander Levetnikov, and probably would have been in the late 90s and he was a, uh, uh, a reformist in Russia and to make a long story short he was poisoned and what they found that he was poisoned with was a radioactive element and it was a radioactive element that is very 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 difficult to get and they found that a piece of this chemical was about the size of a grain of salt was put into the food he ate and that was enough to kill him it took about 30 days but that was enough to have him die 
Now, uh, a couple days ago, like August 18th or 19th, there was another person running against Putin, and he also died of a mysterious poisoning. If you're a mystery novel reader, you would call that the modus operandi, or the MO. That's what Putin does. That's what the Russians do. They poison people to kind of silence them and to know, hey, we can get you at any time. Right? Now, that might be a little bit of a conspiracy, but I think there are people that do believe that, and there's some evidence that Putin probably had something to do with that. So radiation is something we do need to be concerned with. Some chemicals are naturally radioactive. We'll talk about that when we're in the unit on the atom. Some things are corrosive. Corrosive means, oh, maybe you have paint on your car and you spill a corrosive chemical on it. The paint will blister and peel off. That's what it means to be corrosive. If you, let's say you have bad acne, you can actually get uh, a, a chemical peel where they'll use acid on your face and they brush it on very gently with a q-tip and then your skin gets burned somewhat badly and it all peels off and then you have the new skin underneath and it comes back and it looks really good but it takes weeks for that to happen so if someone's going to get a chemical peel on their face they're probably going to take uh, you know do it in the summertime where you don't see them for a month so some chemicals are corrosive. Uh, if it's corrosive to your eyeball, you could easily lose your vision. Some things are an irritant. An irritant might be it's simply pollen or something like that that causes you to cough. You might break into a hive. You might uh, feel constriction in your neck or chest, you know, some tightness. Uh, that's what an irritant is. Now, when we refer to toxicity, we measure toxicity in, in a unit called an LD50. Now, there's different types of toxicity. One is chronic toxicity. And again, the word chronic means over a long period of time. So if you have low dosages of a chemical over a repeated period of time, it can start to do damage to your body one or two exposures probably wouldn't hurt you but it's the multiplication of these factors over and over again is where you have problems <coughs> excuse me some irritant in my house there's also acute toxicity and again this is there's an immediate effect uh, from a single dose or exposure this could be a snake bite this could be an accidental overdose of a, of a chemical compound this would be acute toxicity. It makes you very ill from doing it just one time. Now, the LD50, or lethal dose that kills 50%, that's how we measure toxicity. What this says is you get two groups of people, you give them a, a, a certain amount of material, and you find out what amount of that toxic material you need to give that kills half of the test patients. Now clearly this isn't done on humans, at least not in any intentional way. Now we do have LD50 values when people maybe uh, try to commit suicide or successfully accomplish this. We know what they ingested and we actually have some of that information. But generally this information is done on other animals such as a rat and then we assume that if three milligrams per kilogram of a chemical kills a rat, it would have the same effect on humans. Again, nobody's testing that, but that's how we figure out toxicity, is we run animal tests. You unfortunately cannot do it on a computer. You can't run a simulation or figure it out any other way than see what it does to living animals. I wish this is the way we had labels marked. It would be pretty easy. Least harmful, sort of harmful, kind of dangerous, quite dangerous, oh my gosh, really dangerous. right? But instead, we use these things called LD50s. So let me give you an example here. I have two chemicals, chemical A and chemical B. Chemical A has an LD50 of 3.2 milligrams per kilograms, while chemical B has an LD50 of 48 
milligrams per kilogram. So the question becomes, which is more toxic? I'll give you a second to think about that. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, what'd you come up with? Now, if you said chemical B because it's the bigger number, it's more toxic, you actually made an error in your thinking. I said the smallest amount of material that harms you is more dangerous. Chemical A, you would only have to eat, let's say, 3.2 of these cookies to kill half the population. Chemical B, you would have to eat 48 cookies of the same type before half the population would die. So the smaller number, assuming you have the same units, is more toxic. Now, when I give you a question on the test, it may not be quite as simple. We will learn metric prefixes like kilogram and milligram and decigram and centigram, and I may give you two LD50 values, but have different units. Now, the key to solving that problem will be for you to convert them to the same units first before making that comparison. And we can practice that maybe on the homework and some other time if you ask, okay? All right, how do we measure LD50s? Well, there's different ways you can get chemical exposure. As we mentioned, these tests are not done on humans, um, at least early on, until we assume something's really not perhaps very toxic, then we'll do human testing. But initially, we would probably use a, a rat or something such as that. So there's lots of ways we can express LD50. So acetone, which you did your MSDS sheet on, here's some information for LD50s. It says on the first one, oral rat. That means you would have to drink or eat, so probably drink acetone. You would have to drink 5,800 milligrams per kilogram of body mass that would kill half of the rats. That's 5.8 grams per kilogram of mass. That's actually quite a bit of acetone. It's probably about 10 milliliters, um, which would be like on a, on a glass of water, it would be about that much water on the bottom of the cup of acetone. And so if you weighed 20 kilograms, you would have to drink 20 times that. If you weighed 50 kilograms, you'd have to drink 50 times that. Again, you would have to be drinking an awful lot of that before it would kill you. Now, it can be an irritant. It can cause other problems for you. Inhalation, this is in a rat. This is if you're in a small area, the acetone is volatile, which means it evaporates and you can smell it. So if you're in a room where the concentration of acetone in the room is 50,100 milligrams per cubic meter each hour, if you're in there, that's the concentration that it would take to kill half the rats. And finally, this last one is skin absorption. So if you were to leave your hand in a bucket of acetone for the, a rabbit, if you were soaking a rabbit in this stuff, it would have to absorb 20 grams of the acetone through its body for each kilogram of its mass in order to kill it. Now I know these are kind of morbid thoughts, but this is how we measure toxicity in chemicals to see if they're safe for human consumption. Let me just summarize this and say a little bit of knowledge is going to help you be a little bit safer. You get that knowledge from things like the MSDS sheet or the Material Safety Data Sheet. It lists hazards, special handling instructions, and any special risks associated with that material. By law, it must be provided from the manufacturer if asked. You can generally find these online if you, if you try to look them up. I do need you to know the difference between acute and chronic exposure. Make sure you understand that acute exposure is much more dangerous. A single episode can hurt you. I'm not going to ask you about the difference of a carcinogen, something that causes cancer, a mutagen that causes genetic defects, a tetragen that causes birth defects, or neurotoxins. 
this is all interesting stuff related to exposure of chemicals, but it's beyond the scope of our class. All right, I think tomorrow we will start talking about science, pure science versus technology, and the scientific method, and continue our discussion of chemistry. Thanks for paying attention, and I hope you have a great day. Bye-bye.